variety of speakers, each with extraordinarily deep insights into cybersecurity and IT risk management. Today, we'll take you through the future of cybersecurity, dive into next generation security metrics and the importance of metrics and measurement in cybersecurity. Uh, we'll take a look at threat intelligence and look at ways to protect our critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. Our goal here was to give you all the audience a well-rounded and holistic look into an industry that even though it might appear is at its height, really has just begun. I can tell you without a doubt that the cybersecurity field is quickly surpassing the medical field in not only the number of areas of expertise or branches, but also the depth needed in each one of those branches. For those reasons and more, at Texas A&M University, we plan to be the number one research institute as far as cybersecurity goes in the nation. And currently, we're on our way to building a world-class enterprise cybersecurity organization. We, Aggies, fearless on every cyber front, will be the example of how it's done. Howdy, y'all. How are you doing this morning? Howdy, that's great. It's good to get a nice warm welcome. When you go into a Starbucks, anywhere in the world, from the forbidden city in China to, I don't know, the streets of beautiful Paris, France, when you go into a Starbucks, what is the second thing that you do right after you order your half-calf, half-decaf, tall, strong mocha latte on soy milk? No, of course not. You're ordering just a plain coffee or an Americano. But what's the second thing that you do right after you order that coffee? But what most people do when they walk into a Starbucks anywhere in the world after they order their coffee, they log on to the free Wi-Fi. Now, it turns out that some people, specifically the customers of Starbucks in Argentina, of all places, they actually had gotten more than their money's worth with their cup of coffee. It turns out that their computers were being used by criminals to mine for cryptocurrencies. I believe it shows us how we can actually learn from the way cyber criminals are innovating. And I absolutely believe that we can learn a lot from the hackers out there. And not only that, not all hackers are bad. Barnaby Jack, I don't know if you've ever heard about him. He was an infamous hacker from New Zealand. And his research first showed everybody in the world how he could literally make an ATM machine throw money at him. In fact, after this demonstration, which was conducted in a big hacker convention in Las Vegas, they called this technique jackpotting in his honor. After jackpotting ATMs, Barnaby Jack graduated to looking at something even more critical to our everyday lives. Something that we rely on every day, something that a lot of people trust their lives with. He started looking at hacking the human body, specifically hacking medical devices. It was thanks to his research work that it was proven that with a single command and a radio antenna, an attacker could remotely trigger an insulin pump to release, release all of the remaining insulin in one single shot into a patient's bloodstream. In fact, it was Barnaby who said, sometimes it's up to us hackers to demonstrate a threat so that we may spark a solution in the world. And I absolutely took his words to heart. It was my original inspiration when I was invited to speak on that TED platform in 2014. The idea that, yes, hackers can actually make us better and safer because they push us to evolve. The Girl Scouts of the United States have launched a program to teach Girl Scouts hacking skills and give them merit badges, not just for building a fire or tracking a rabbit in a forest, but for cybersecurity skills. And isn't that something? That gives me a lot of hope because I actually am a very big believer in the next generation of friendly hackers out there. Oftentimes in security, we have a mythical sense of perfection, some ominous perfect hacker, nation state, all knowing, knowing digital something or other. That is not actually who you're competing against. You're always competing against your next best achievement. 
we have, if we're in a successful business, if you're in a successful business in a successful college, that business in college is in the business of exposing more value to more people through more channels at higher volumes. They're in the magnitude of exposure game. If you're successful, that's how you sell stuff. By the way, that's how they've been doing it for thousands of years, right? You expose more value. On the other hand, we have the bad guys and gals. They're in the business of exploiting more value, right, through more channels at higher volumes. And then we sit right in the middle. So when people say to you, how much more security, I get asked that as a CISO all the question, that question all the time, my response to them is more. Why? Because I sit between these two magnitudes, right, of exposure and exposure taking advantage. Your job is always to beat the competing model, which is your last, most previous best effort. One of the problems we have between different groups within an organization is that people don't speak the same language. I had an interesting conversation the other day with some fraud people at, at uh, my company, and we were talking about classless interdomain routing. Anyone know what that is? It's a pretty basic networking thing, right? Well, when I talked to the fraud people, they were trying to create some rules within their system, and they were trying to you know, block a bunch of uh, adjacent networks. And so I'm like, well, why don't you just use a slash 21 instead of you know, producing all these different entries and, and consolidated because I know your platform supports CIDR. So they said, CIDR? <laughs> There's a big problem there where you know, me working in the, the cyber side of the business, I am well equipped to deal with this problem and to help them, but there's a little bit of education that needs to occur uh, across the enterprise to make sure that we are doing our part to help them to solve their problems. One day when I was working in the NTOC, in the NSA, um, sitting there doing my analysis, and two people come up behind me and uh, get tapped on the shoulder. Hey, John, uh, we got this new guy from NSA Hawaii. He's come out to, to learn his targets and, and learn, um, learn some of the, the different tools that we have here. Can you show him the, the knowledge base that we're creating? So um, I actually found a picture of this guy on the internet, internet, and he's wearing the same exact blazer. You can't see the skinny jeans in this picture, but he's wearing the same stuff. So Ed sat down next to me and proceeded to stare into space for the next 15 minutes while I showed him uh, the ins and outs of our knowledge management system. I guess he just figured he would steal it later. There are a lot of different threats out there, and I'm, I'm talking about impacts here, but this man was devastating. It was not a, a pretty situation when we found out what happened. Morale there, when we went on Monday, it was awful. And the reason was, we realized the, the initial scope was, was uh, not good. Um, people were predicting various things. We eventually, you know, uh, I didn't learn, but they, they worked out to, f to find out what was taken. Um, I did get a little insight because when they first started the investigation on what he stole, it was right behind me. They had two interns, and every 10 minutes they were, they were like, oh, he got that. In critical infrastructure, you often have very large budgets, okay, and very large assets that you're being protected, like thousands or millions of lives. Okay? So that's what I'm going to focus on now, is how do you protect when you have very well-funded adversaries and extremely valuable assets? Okay? And as you'll see, a number of the techniques can be used in other cases, but this is the case where the return on investment is strongest in the critical infrastructure case, and that's why we focus on the highest security. You have the good guys, but there's a lot of other bad guys out there that also have near-infinite budgets. Okay? So what happens here is their budgets are so large that if there exists a vulnerability that is not known, they will find it. So the goal is that whoever is the owner, the operator, the admin, right, whoever is in charge in the, uh, of the correct operations is in complete control of the critical systems. Okay? This is the goal. Are we there yet? Go read the news. Often we talk about in security this concept of attack surface reduction. Now most of the time when we talk about attack surface reduction, the term is used to things like, how do I minimize the amount of code that's running? How do I turn off ports and things like that? Okay? What I want to use that term to refer to now is how many different organizations and people are you having to trust? So the minimum that you could ever possibly get to is having to trust your own admins, right? The goal is those are the guys you want to be in control, okay? Everybody else is past the theoretical minimum. How close can you get to only having to trust your own admins and nobody else in the world, okay? 
you can't actually get there in practice. The closest you can get to in practice is having to trust whoever creates your security chip. And so many things have security chips, and I'll talk about them later on. Um, one example is the chips that's in your credit card, or if you've heard of a TPM that's in your laptops and, and phones and all those things. Whoever creates that security chip, you're trusting that that hardware does what it claims to be doing. And by extension, you're also trusting the government in whose jurisdiction that chip was manufactured. You're not only having to trust the chip manufacturer, but also the government, because the government has legal ways to compel the manufacturers in their jurisdiction to do things. And so they're not the bad guys, because they're following the laws, right? It's how many different organizations do you actually trust? So the first question, which actually came from uh, outside of Texas A&M, um, is how does a young person begin a career in cybersecurity as a high school student that wants a career in cybersecurity, what would you suggest he or she study or do to prepare? You even need to look at some other skills that are complementary. Um, I'm, a, I'm a tactical manager. My guys are the people who are, are doing a lot of the things that are not strategic in, in the org. They're writing the reports. They're, they're documenting things. Um, technical writing is golden in oh, yeah. my experience. If you have someone who can write really well on your team, uh, as a manager, I love to delegate to that person and trust them that they're going to be able to do that. And just having uh, effective communicators. So, you know, my recommendation as you, you learn things, don't neglect learning how to talk to people. Don't neglect learning how to write. Uh, these are very important skills regardless of where your career may take you. What do you think the future of cybersecurity looks like? How do you feel cybersecurity will change in our more connected world? We have to look at what, you know, what is causal to security. What causes security to be uh, uh, needed? It's because of the exposure, right? You have the ex constant exposure to do transactions, right? To trade goods, be they ephemeral goods or, or hard goods. One of the things that I see, and I think a lot of people are seeing now, is um, privacy is starting to emerge as a very, very important issue. And um, this is going to influence the direction that cybersecurity moves in the future for sure. I do believe that there's going to be a lot of room for that human intuition. But that brings us to the biggest challenge of it all. Where is all that talent going to come from? Where is the world going to get you know, a million more security professionals? Hopefully from this room. I'm looking at you young guys, but over there as well. Hopefully Texas A&M is going to help generate a lot of that security talent that's going to be needed. Yes, we, we're, we're, we're trying to do our best. Good. Um, I actually saw Dr. Ragsdale, he is, Dr. Ragsdale, if you'd stand up, he is doing beyond his part in making sure that we are the least uh, deficient in cybersecurity talent at Texas a and